Most students struggle with the six mark questions and in this video I'd like to show you a technique that you can use to get much better at these type of questions. My name is Lewis Matheson from Physics Online and the techniques I'm going to talk about can be used across all subjects, in particular science, and I've got some examples from both GCSE and A-level physics. Now what I'd like you to do is completely reframe the way that you approach these questions and rather than thinking I need to get six marks, all I want you to do is aim for four out of six. Four marks is something which seems quite achievable and to be honest, four out of six is a really good mark. That's 67%. Now, how does that compare to the grade boundaries? Well, these are the grade boundaries from an OCR Exploring Physics paper in 2021, and you needed to get 66 out of 100 to get an A grade, which is the kind of thing that most people would be absolutely over the moon to achieve. It's the same at GCSE. This is uh, the grade boundaries from an OCR paper from 2020, and across both papers, you needed 127 out of 180 to get a grade seven. That's only 62%. And it's the same if you look at most grade boundaries. So maybe by reframing these long answer questions as something where you're only aiming to get four out of six, suddenly that's something which seems a lot more achievable, so you're more like, likely to begin that task, and yet that will still give you the kind of grade that most people would be over the moon to receive. And this is the technique that you can use in many areas of your life. This is the way that you can avoid procrastination. For example, you might have on your to-do list, revise GCSE physics, but if instead you're to break that down to more smaller manageable tasks, you're much more likely to start. If one of your tasks is just to print out the 2020 paper, well, that's something that you could easily do. And by the sounds of it, by the time you actually print out the paper, you'd probably actually have a read through it and have a look at some of the questions and start thinking about your approach to those answers. So by starting small, having an achievable goal, you're far more likely to get started. And that's really important when it comes to practicing. As a teacher, I've seen and I've marked mock exams that my students did where students were getting all of the numerical answers correct and they just completely left some of the six markers because they didn't want to start. They were afraid of failing by not getting the full six out of six. And it's the same when you do mock papers. I know most students will happily do the numerical answers. You can check in the mark scheme and you know if you're correct or not. And it's the same with multiple choice. But the longer answer questions are where people are a bit more unsure and therefore they're less likely to start them. So let's have a look at uh, maybe a couple of techniques we can use. The first one is I want you to think about writing in bullet points. Bullet points are super useful because they allow you to structure your answer and make sure you're actually answering what the question is actually asking you. And indeed, in many examiners reports, it even states that students would have benefited from structuring their answer with bullet points. Now that doesn't mean that you need to use bad grammar, it still means that you have to be able to spell key scientific terms correctly, but bullet points can really help structure your answer. Now the first example is an A-level question. Uh, this one has um, an experiment that probably 99% of the students will never have carried out. There's a table of data, um, or there's some data here in the question, and also a graph. Now the first part of this six marker is just to describe the shape of the two graphs. Now that's something that even a GCSE student can do. How can you describe what they look like? Well, we could basically say that both uh, lines are a straight line that goes through the origin, and therefore the mass is proportional to the, temp to the time in minutes. So already, that's one easy mark that you can gain. And I suppose the other thing you could say looking at this data is that uh, the beaker in figure 17.1 has a heater, and that's got a greater gradient, so more mass of water melts per second. So already, just writing down a couple of bullet points, I reckon I've got at least two marks out of six, and therefore I'm halfway towards my aim of getting four out of six marks. We can maybe explain the shape uh, in terms of the energy being transferred per second. Uh, the actual last bit here says, determine the specific latent heat of fusion of ice. So actually, even though this is a six mark question, there's a calculation sort of hidden amongst it. And I know most people doing A-level physics, well, 90% of you are going to be doing A-level maths, and the maths for something like this should be fairly straightforward. And all I did to work at this final answer was look at the energy supplied by the heater, uh, and therefore uh, divided that extra energy by the, the difference in the mass to get this answer. Now, 
The numerical answer for this one isn't particularly important, but what I've done is I switched my mindset from thinking I need to cover every possibility to get all the six marks and think, okay, if I can get four out of six, I'm happy with that. That's getting me or keeping me at that A grade, which is maybe what I'm aiming for at the end of it. Now, no doubt when you start it, you'll realise there's other bits that you can talk about and therefore you may be likely to get that uh, five or even six out of six. I mean, ultimately, out of the thousands of students who will have done this paper, a very, very small amount will have got six out of six, but that doesn't matter. At least you've got the easy marks which are available. We can maybe do the same with a GCSE question. And again, we can see this is an unfamiliar experiment that's using common equipment, maybe set up in a different way. Now, the difficulty with this, uh, like a lot of GCSE questions, is there's a lot to read and then try and comprehend that. However, there's this kind of page of doom, the six marks which are available. But again, let's maybe just try and get four out of six. We can write in bullet points. Um, there's some kind of clear things here um, that we can use to structure our answer. How do you determine the force that this collides with? Uh, what about the effect of crumple zones? Any precautions that you might take? Now again, you might not get six out of six. I doubt very few students actually did that. But if you approach this thinking, can I get four easy marks, then you're more likely to start and therefore get all of the marks which are available to you on that paper. We get one mark just for thinking about the equation that the force is equal to the rate of change of momentum. And if we're looking at the rate of change of momentum, we need to think about things like the mass and then how you can measure that. And a lot of this is just interpreting what's in a question. So we can measure the mass with the mass balance. Uh, it does say that U and V are measured, and then we can measure the collision time, delta T, with the millisecond timer. And if you know all of that information, we can then work out the size of the force. Later on, you might talk about how if you've got a greater crumple zone, then that means there's going to be a greater collision time. And that means for the same change in momentum, there's going to be a greater time of impact, and therefore the size of the force is going to decrease and maybe precautions you can take to get uh, accurate results. A lot of this just comes down to simple things like perhaps releasing it from the same height each time, taking repeat readings, taking repeat readings, taking repeat readings. All of this stuff that I know that you know. So the last bit of advice I've got is how you can prepare for any exams you have coming up is you need to know about some of the core practicals. Now there's no secret, and I'm sure as you do more and more past papers, you'll realise that there are questions which ask you about common methods. How do you look at the internal resistance of a cell? How do you measure the speed of water waves in a ripple tank? Now a lot of this stuff you can learn off by heart. And if you know the equipment, if you know the measurements that you're going to take, if you know a formula that you can use or maybe a graph that you can plot, that's an easy four out of six marks. And that's something that you can guarantee. I predict, and I don't do predicted papers, but I predict in your exams this year, there will be questions that come up which you will have seen before and you will have prepared for. So ultimately, that is my secret to how to actually get started with six markers. If you go in aiming for four out of six, it's a, it's a much more achievable task. You're more likely to start those questions and that means you're more likely to prepare for them. And when it comes to your final exam, the wordy things won't be as bad as you expected. Don't forget, of course, that you should keep writing in bullet points. It'll help you and it'll help the person marking your paper. Thanks so much for watching. If you haven't already done so, don't forget that you can subscribe on YouTube. You can also head over to my websites, which are GCSE Physics Online and A-Level Physics Online. If you sign up there, you'll find there's hundreds of extra videos where I cover everything you need to know to prepare for any of your physics exams. Thank you so much.